Well, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, welcome uh, to Scottish Parliament. It's such a long time since uh, I've had the opportunity to, to say that and to actually welcome uh, meetings in uh, in Parliament, and it's uh, uh, it, it's a delight to have you here. And uh, today we're going to discuss on behalf of Scottish Environment Link. We're going to discuss about uh, giving nature a home, and I think. It's well known that we're in a climate emergency, but one of the things I think we forget to point out is it's also a nature emergency, and the two go hand in hand, and it's a twin crisis, I think, that has to be tackled. Uh, and we know that nature has been lost uh, at an inordinate rate around the world. Um, but I was reminded uh, this morning from a certain uh, David Attenborough about how we can, uh, it's not too late, how the, 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 the whales were nearly fished to extinction and uh, uh, through a concerted effort there's now more whales uh, in, in the world than uh, any of our generation have ever seen. So we can, with political will, make a difference. I think that's on the back of uh, our pride at the old Glasgow in Scotland, the UK played in hosting uh, cl uh, Climate COP26 and the recognition uh, and the energy and the focus it brought to the city around climate action. Now I think we'd all agree uh, that, that COP26 perhaps fell short of where we hoped it would go but we also have to recognise there were wins and I think the final pact acknowledged nature's national climate policy and, and nature's critical role sorry, in achieving that one and a half degrees the first time and it recognises the need to integrate nature into the national climate policy and accepting that the importance uh, of the uh, ecosystem integrity. COP26 I think broadly recognises that there is there is no road to uh, one and a half degrees without nature and having the final text acknowledge that is critical because we are as I said losing nature at an alarming rate. I think now it's nature's turn to be in the spotlight uh, with Biodiversity COP15 in Kunming in China this year and in line with the Edinburgh Declaration on post-2020 global biodiversity, Scotland has an opportunity to show how sub-national government across the world can lead the way in creating a nature-positive future for our planet. If we look at Scotland's role, I think the parliamentary session, this parliamentary session is critical for nature. There are enormous opportunities ahead I think across the chamber we recognise that we can't allow it to go beyond, the action to go beyond this particular session. I think the, the, in the autumn we, we wait the Scottish Government launching its new biodiversity strategy. Uh, next year it's, it will also in, introduce an agricultural bill and a natural environment bill with a promise of legally binding nature um, recovery targets as part of the latter. I think today is a rare opportunity for us to come together on a cross-party basis and think about the opportunities ahead and how we realise our shared objectives of a prosperous, nature-rich, net-zero Scotland that's good for nature, climate and people. So we have uh, several speakers, some great speakers today, and, and without further ado, we'll go to them. And, and, and to kick off the discussion, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Dr Deborah Long, who's the Chief Officer at Scottish Environment Link, Dr Paul Walton of RSPB Scotland, Mel Revel Hayward who is RSPB Scotland and Dr Christopher Ellis at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. So can we start please with Dr Deborah Long? Thank you. Thank you very much Brian. And to, Brian's absolutely right, today is um, the start we hope of nature being in the spotlight. What I'm going to do is just give you a very quick um, tour of COP15, what it's about and what Scotland's ambition in relation to COP15 should be. So COP15 is the nature COP. It's basically the equivalent to the climate COP that happened in Glasgow in November. And it's where international parties or countries come together to agree the action needed to restore and protect nature. In 2019, the IPBES Global Assessment of Biodiversity showed the accelerating rate of species extinctions with an estimation of around 1 million animal and plant species threatened by extinction and ecosystems shrinking, deteriorating or disappearing. 
Dramatic declines in biodiversity across the globe call for a step up in action. And to that effect, the UN has declared this decade the decade for ecosystem restoration. Like climate, this is the decade where we need to act before it's too late. So at COP15, what we'll see is we'll see, we hope, the adoption of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which provides a strategic vision to be living in harmony with nature by 2050, and a global roadmap for the conservation, protection, restoration, and sustainable management of biodiversity and ecosystems over the next decade. It's got some ambitious targets, and it has, to be, it has the potential to be far-reaching if it is adopted. Draft one of the framework was released in July 2021. It's built, built on lessons learned in the past, and it recognises that urgent policy action, both globally, regionally, and nationally, is required to transform economic, social, and financial models so that the trends that have exacerbated biodiversity loss will stabilise by 2030, and will recover with net improvements by 2050. So that's what it's planning to do. This is a really big deal. And if Scotland wants to be a leader in biodiversity, as we do, and as the First Minister wants us to be, then Scotland's biodiversity strategy needs to be able to deliver it. And to do that, it needs to be strong, it needs to reach across government, and it needs to be ambitious. And what we're hoping to see is that nature appears in every portfolio just like climate and net zero is now in post COP26. Brian's already mentioned the Edinburgh Declaration and Scotland, even though we're not a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity, that's the UK, Scotland's still got an important role because we are taking the Edinburgh Declaration to Kunming. And that declaration is a call from sub-national governments like Scotland, cities and local authorities to take strong and bold actions to bring about transformative change to halt biodiversity loss. I just remembered I forgot my slides. Uh, just to remind you, this is a QR code. It's on the table in front of you, and this takes you to the briefing of the, of the session. So that was the first slide about what COP26 was all, COP was all about. And now I'm talking about the Edinburgh Declaration. Um, so the Edinburgh Declaration is a call to take strong and bold actions to bring about transformative change to hold biodiversity loss to recognise the vital role of sub-national governments, cities and local authorities in delivering this vision for biodiversity. It calls for the greater inclusion of sub-national governments, cities and local authorities, and it establishes a multi-stakeholder platform that ensures the representation. And that's really important. This is a big global crisis and everyone needs to be involved. Now, our next slide is a short film that we've prepared. It's a preview. So this is, is an early draft. So you're getting a, a pre-launch view. And it's um, about COP15 and the contribution of what's going to happen in Scotland, what we hope will happen in Scotland. really summarises where we think Scotland can take us as part of our action towards COP15 and towards action to restore and protect nature. In terms of what we can specifically do in Scotland, 
we're already seeing leadership on, on biodiversity and, addre and addressing the nature crisis as part of the climate crisis, and we really welcome that and want that to continue. Scotland can be a leader in biodiversity, we just need to do it. We want to see nature put at the heart of government, I've already said this, and we're looking to see nature in all portfolios and all of government working so that they've got nature in mind. It has to become the new climate and net zero targets, that's where we want nature to be. And perhaps Scotland's new biodiversity strategy should be our nature emergency strategy because that's what we need it to tackle. We're looking, the global target is to protect 30% of land and seas, and obviously we'd like to see that in Scotland, and we're, well, we want to see them properly protected. So 30% of land and seas properly protected for nature. Part of that is delivering a nature network, um, and this is to protect and restore our habitats and native species so that they can move in response to pressures from climate change and land use. Then, of course, Brian also mentioned this, there's reforming the farming subsidy. 75% of Scotland's farmland is farmed, so we need to be looking at how we spend that public money so that we've got land management that supports nature, supports climate and supports rural communities. And then finally, we are looking for the strong, ambitious, legally binding targets to restore nature just so we know where we need to get to in the next decade of ecosystem restoration and how we can get there. So that's a quick whiz through COP15 and what, what we um, can be doing in Scotland and hope we will be doing in Scotland. I'm going to hand over now to um, the rest of the panel and to Paul, who's going to speak next. Thanks very much, Deborah. And um, you didn't need the slides, actually. You were talking <laughs> compellingly enough. Good. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how encouraging it is to come here and sit and hear an elected official talking the language of the climate emergency and the nature emergency being part of the same thing. This was exactly my opening uh, comments, actually, and, and you preempted me, which is fantastic. I mean, I really, I tell you, I mean, even just a few years ago, it, it simply wouldn't have happened. So I think we've come, come, come a huge way and it is massively appreciated. So thanks, Brian, for your opening. It was, it was most encouraging. I mean, everyone here is familiar painfully familiar with the climate emergency. Everyone here has seen David Attenborough um, TV documentaries and, uh, and has felt that, that, that massive impact that humanity is having on the natural world. But the narrative we must develop now is that these are two sides of the same coin. That the nature and climate emergency are essentially the same thing. One drives the other and the solutions to them must be synergistic and work together. If we find solutions to the climate emergency that then drive nature further down, we will ultimately in the long term all lose out. So where are we with nature in Scotland? This is a, 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 a statistic, really, a measure, an index developed by the Natural History Museum down in Kensington in London and now adopted by the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, which COP15 is all about, and indeed uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services that Deborah mentioned, the two main United Nations um, establish, establishments for biodiversity. Um, and what it does, basically, is it looks at um, areas of natural habitat um, in, in one country and then compares that to the, the, kind of the, the species composition of it and how intact it is with the one that are, ones that are comparable elsewhere in the world but have the very minimum human impact on them just to see kind of how, how intact things are and then it sort of averages that all up and, and then looks at 240 countries and territories round, right around the world and, and, and racks them in terms of the intactness of their biodiversity and the, the outcome for the UK countries broken down is as follows that's England that's Northern Ireland that's Wales and that's Scotland, and that is the whole, all of the countries. They're not all named on the bottom because it wasn't room on the graph. That's all the countries in the world. So Scotland, relatively speaking, our nature is in good condition within the UK, but relative to the rest of the world, we are 212th out of 240 countries. We're 28 from the bottom. And what this, the key thing that this reflects is the historic impact that human beings have had on nature in this country 
because it looks at you know, the intactness compared to something before any human impacts happened. And it's simply a, a, a reflection of the Industrial Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution in the 18th century, and um, wars, etc. I mean, it, uh, this is not a, a blame game. This is about understanding the state of our environment. And it's a pretty sobering message. But of course, a whole lot has been done for nature um, in, in our lifetimes. Uh, there's loads of conservation, conservation organisations, Nature Scott, um, the, the, the governments uh, and elected officials are taking uh, biodiversity really seriously. And so where are we with that? This is the State of Nature report, which is a coalition production produced every three years. The next one is actually due in 2023. This is from 2019. There's been a COVID gap. But it, it, it's a coalition of a huge number of, um, of learned societies, conservation organisations, universities, etc., and in 2019, I'm absolutely delighted to say that after much negotiation, um, um, Nature Scott, uh, the government agency, signed up to this report. And this has become a real shared evidence base between the, the voluntary sector and the government sector, which is fab a fabulously progressive move, I think, and has not been replicated elsewhere in the UK. So um, we're very, very grateful for that. And it shows that nature is in decline still. So uh, this is the average abundance of those species that we really have very, very accurate, statistically valid and, and, and absolutely sequential data across the years where we know for sure what's happened to them. We look at all of those species, average it out, the abundance of those species is going down. The headline messages from this report are that the 24% in average species abundance in Scotland there's been a 14% decline in average species distribution. That's the occupancy of species, that their range is shrinking. And 11% of species in Scotland are threatened with national extinction. So a lot has been done, but we are still on a path to losing nature from a very low starting point due to the historical vagaries that this country has experienced. And so we are on trajectory to lose more species like this great auk a species that had a big breeding population in Scotland and is now globally extinct, we are on the same trajectory. So we need to step up our action. Is it hopeless? Of course it isn't. We need to think about our native ecosystems. And here we have a really, really useful model in terms of what's been achieved for peatland. Uh, our peatlands in the flow country of, of, of Sutherland um, are probably the world's biggest contiguous blanket bog and massively important for nature and hugely important as a carbon store. And so when in the 1980s there was destructive draining, ploughing and foresting with non-native conifers, the NGOs mounted a campaign, eventually government policy changed, and now we're in a situation where the Scottish government is putting major investment into a peatland action fund and to a peatland code to try to scale up peatland restoration across that ecosystem across Scotland. We need to do something similar for other ecosystems too. We need to do the same for kelp beds. We need to do it for eelgrass beds, for species-rich grassland on farm, on the macker in the Western Isles, globally unique crop mackers that we have in the US. We need to do it for Caledonian pinewoods, and we need to do it for Scotland's rainforest. The next biodiversity strategy is an opportunity for us to define what our important ecosystems are and develop programmes for each of them using the Peatland Action Fund as a broad model and really invest and really lever private finance into meaningful change, positive change in restoring our ecosystems. And that way, our biodiversity intactness index will start moving up the global rankings. So we need to reimagine things um, politically in Scotland. And I think the key that we need to see now is the mainstreaming of biodiversity. For far too long, biodiversity has been siloed over here is something it's very nice to do it's nature we all watch david after fine let's focus on the real world we really need biodiversity to be fully integrated into much wider policy economic policy land use policy marine policy development policy planning all of these things need to have biodiversity fully mainstreamed and integrated within them and the biodiversity strategy is a key opportunity to do that and a key stepping stone to the environment bill which brian was mentioning which has to be the main opportunity for us here in Scotland to really take a big step forward. So we have a huge amount to be proud of in this country. I don't want to leave with the message that we think that there's nothing left. We have a massive amount of precious wildlife still there 
We mustn't lose it. We are losing it right now on our watch. We need to wake up to the reality of the situation and move on in a constructive and collegiate way. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be here this afternoon. I'm going to pick up where uh, Paul left off by looking at a specific example of an ecosystem, our forests and woodlands in Scotland. I think in the next biodiversity strategy, it's important to build on a legacy of existing information and to recognise that beneath that generality of forests and woodlands, there's a great diversity of, um, of habitats. So we might think about Caledonian pine woods, or our native oak woods, or our ash and hazel woods. So in Scotland, we've got a diversity of, of, of tree species, of native tree species. We've got a diversity of age structures within our woodlands. And some of those woodlands have got deep continuity in time that allows biodiversity to, to develop and to, um, and to accrue. So I think what we're looking for is a, is a, is a network, a mosaic of different um, habitats, a mosaic that recognises that diversity rather than uh, homogeneity, a, a sort of one-size-fits-all solution. And to understand that different kinds of woodlands have different um, attributes, some are, are, are particularly beneficial for, for biodiversity, others might have um, different uh, legitimate concerns, such as commercial forestry. So we need to, to recognise those differences, and we need to plan for those differences, and to integrate biodiversity into our landscape planning. If we don't, then we miss out on the opportunity to conserve some of our most important habitats. And I'm going to exemplify that with Scotland's rainforest. So um, biologists divide the world up into different biomes, into different ecosystems, often correlated with climate, with temperature and precipitation. And there's such a thing as temperate rainforest. And the conditions for temperate rainforest cover less than 1% of the global land area. And that's compared to tropical rainforests that cover 7%, or boreal forests that cover 17%. And this little map here in green shows the area of temperate rainforest in the UK, which correlates on the west with our oceanic climate, a climate that is wet and mild. And this graph here shows the intensity of those oceanic conditions, where the blue is the most intense. So the optimum conditions for, for temperate rainforest occur in the west of Scotland, Scotland's, um, Scotland's rainforest. And classically, it's our hazelwoods, our ashwoods, our oak woods, beautiful, um, beautiful habitats. And they house a really charismatic diversity of species that are often growing on the trees themselves as, as epiphytes, weird and wonderful uh, lichens, or bryophytes, for example. And if we look at the global distribution of these species, Here's an example at the top, Pseudocyphalaria norvegica, very common on the west coast of Scotland. If you want to see these species elsewhere, you might go to the islands in the Atlantic or down to Chile. And another example here, occurring in Scotland, if you want to see it elsewhere, <clears throat> you might go to southwest Norway or uh, west of North America. So these are globally rare species. Um, if you look at their distributions in the UK, you can see on this dot map their distributions are very, very heavily centred on um, Scotland's rainforest on the west coast. So we've got global responsibility for this incredibly rare ecosystem internationally that's full of this kind of charismatic biodiversity. That's been championed now by the Alliance for Scotland's Rainforest that have recognised that there's only about 30,000 hectares of this rainforest still existing in Scotland in these isolated and, and fragmented patches. And we did a piece of work where we looked at records that volunteers had provided over the decades and the change in the populations of the species associated with this rainforest. And it's a negative change index over the last five decades, which means that their distributions and their populations are declining, and they've been declining for at least five decades, and that's despite having um, you know, various uh, conservation protections, protected sites. So species are declining despite our uh, conservation network, and that signals that we need better condition of protected sites, and we need larger and more interconnected populations. We need more of this rainforest in the landscape for its resilience. Um, the Alliance has, uh, has, has launched a rainforest restoration fund, and there's now political will behind conservation of, of Scotland's rainforest, which is, um, which is fantastic. 
So to summarise, if we think about our woodlands over time, so from the past to the future, as Paul um, mentioned, thinking over historic time, we've seen a decline in our woodlands. That goes right back to the Neolithic, but it continues right up, for example, to plantations on ancient woodland sites. And that takes us to where we are today with our nature crisis, where we've got these tiny patches of protected habitat, and we need to maintain their conditions. So, for example, our oak woods being threatened by rhododendron as, a, as an invasive species. And what we're looking to in the future is an expansion of that woodland again, an expansion of biodiversity across the wider landscape. And um, with respect to rainforests, some of our evidence suggests that the best way to do that is to, is to regenerate around existing nodes of biodiversity. But as well as this landscape approach, as well as thinking about the wider landscape, we also need to continue to, um, to, to protect our, our, you know, to continue to manage our protected sites. Because they're the source. They're the source <clears throat> from which these uh, species can disperse across the wider landscape in the future. So as well as taking this expansive approach, we still need the intensive care of our protected sites. To, um, to maintain those species and populations, as well as this expansion across the landscape, and then they can, they can recolonise um, across Scotland more widely. <clears throat> so to summarise, it's really important to recognise what we've got in Scotland and to target, um, to target the biodiversity that continues to exist. And Scotland's rainforest is a great example. That spatial planning is, re is required to accommodate um, Scotland's biodiversity alongside or where necessary above other interests and mosaic of interests and then if we look at our rainforest its biodiversity is in decline and we need to balance those two issues we need that remedial protection of existing species and populations alongside that expansion of rainforest across the wider landscape so we need to maximize the quality and the quantity of our specific ecosystems in a, in a national framework Thank you very much. The observant amongst you will notice that we've only got three speakers up here and we said there were four, and there is four, but Millie has tested positive for COVID, so she's not here, but she's kindly recorded a video for us, so we're going to um, show Millie's video now. Mr. Barry. Apologies that I am unable to join you in person, but I really hope that this presentation will give you an idea of what I, as a young person, um, think we need to do to protect nature in Scotland um, and why it's so important that we do. My name is Millie Rebel Hayward. Um, I am currently working as an RSPB campaigns officer, but I'm also a youth advocate, um, especially for people. Um, so just a quick bit about nature and people in Scotland and more specifically kind of my story. Um, so I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland, meaning that I was able to grow up alongside some of the most beautiful and wild landscapes. Um, growing up in Scotland, I think nature really provided me with an escape and has always given me a sense of kind of peace and calm whenever I spend time in nature. And I think that this is something that a lot of people have experienced, especially over the last few years. Um, and it's really starting to be valued as this incredible thing that we can escape to and get joy out of. Um, but my relationship with nature has fluctuated. Sometimes I've felt more connected to nature um, other times not so much um, and so I just want to, to kind of point out that our relationship with nature must be nurtured and if you're not someone who's currently connected to nature that doesn't mean that you never will be and just going out and spending some time outside and admiring all those small things in nature or the things that you've maybe not noticed before um, you know could be truly special. So I think by the time it gets to my presentation, I expect that this will have already been covered. Um, but I wanted to go through some aspects of the current state of nature in Scotland. 
here in Scotland, we have some of the most incredible and beautiful nature, from vast peatlands in the full country to precious temperate rainforests on the west coast. And the habitats and ecosystems exist in Scotland sustain an array of wildlife, such as hen harriers, basking sharks, beavers, mussels, lichens, and mosses. But as you all know, so much of this wonderful nature that we often take for granted is in trouble. So here in Scotland, the abundance and distribution of species has, on average, declined over recent decades. And we're currently ranked as 28th from the bottom in the Biodiversity in Tatnus Index, meaning that nature in Scotland is more depleted than 88% of the 240 countries and territories across the world in this index. Additionally, one in nine of our precious species are at risk of extinction, and this is spread across a range of taxonomic groups. 18% of land in Scotland is currently protected under some category, um, but this doesn't mean that 18% of that is effectively matched, um, and not all of these are in good condition. So this means that although 18% is good, we still have a long way to go. There are many threats to nature in Scotland, um, which is evident from the decline in abundance and distribution of species. Um, and these pressures come from a whole range of places. So whether it be direct threats, such as urbanization, land use, and pollution, and non-native species, um, or climate change, which as we know is causing widespread changes to the abundance, distribution, and ecology of Scotland's wildlife. All of these threats need to be tackled with high ambition so that we can fight the nature crisis. But I think there's some other challenges that we also face as well. Challenges such as the lack of connection to nature, which as I mentioned before, you know, can be something that a lot of people face if you're not feeling particularly inspired by nature. Um, and I think it's really difficult trying to empower the public to take action and show people what we need to protect if they don't feel protected, uh, don't feel connected to nature. And alongside this, I think that issues with accessibility and inequalities mean that some people just don't have the same opportunities to spend time and learn from nature in Scotland as others. And so we need to really work to make sure that more people can make these connections. So our first and foremost aim is to halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity. Um, and we need to have ambitious action targets and pledges from the governments which will tackle key pressures and drivers of biodiversity loss. We need action that places nature and biodiversity at the heart of everything we do. Um, and we need you to speak up for the habitats and species which have maybe been overlooked in the fast paced world of government in the past. We need your commitment to ensure that Scotland and its nature is protected and to help the people of Scotland who deeply care about these issues um, ensure they have a voice. We need you to listen to individuals and communities who are currently taking action. I think we really saw how powerful people can be during COP last year um, and there's already so many amazing projects, but we need the government to back these projects and individuals and communities in order to scale up and really make a difference. We also need you, um, our representatives, to fully understand what we are fighting for. Um, we need the people in power to experience nature, to understand why it's so important that we do the advocacy work that we do. I want to just finish up by asking you a couple questions. What does the future of Scotland's nature look like to you? And how can we be optimistic about the future? I'm optimistic about the future, but I do feel sometimes naive for thinking that way. 
it's a very scary and uncertain thing to think about the future of Scotland and its nature, especially when it often feels like we're not being listened to as young people. Um, and it's difficult to know exactly what to do. But I take inspiration from the individuals and groups across Scotland who are already doing amazing things. And I think that if we just look back to nature and take away all the beautiful moments that we can have, we can continue to be inspired and feel optimistic. We just need you to help us make the big changes um, so that we can have a brighter future for Scotland. Thank you. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree. Um, two very excellent presentations. Hello, everyone. Oh, yeah. Hello, uh, Hello, time. Um, yeah, I'm getting heckled already. Um, I'm used to that. Um, I think three presentations that bring uh, the, the crisis very starkly into focus. Um, and before we go on to questions, I just want to um, let everybody know that I have uh, colleagues from across the chamber in the room today, which probably well, will hopefully um, you recognise that uh, despite our, our now, and, now and again we have uh, our differences, we are collectively uh, driving towards um, uh, the, the climate emergency, driving towards solutions for the climate emergency and nature emergency. With Fiona Hislop uh, from the SNP, uh, uh, Sue Weber uh, from Scottish Conservatives, from Megan Gallagher from Scottish Conservatives, the one-legged Finn Carson, uh, <laughs> and, and Monica Lennon from Scottish Labour. So we have representation in here, uh, an interest in here uh, from across the chamber. So hopefully that gives you, or helps you to, to have a little bit of hope in, in that, that how seriously the whole of the parliament uh, take this. So we have the opportunity for questions. Um, and uh, as I say, we'll, we'll take them just now. I, I uh, well, Finn Carson, good grief. Right, Finn. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, really fascinating and uh, it's been a pleasure listening to the presentations. Um, uh, the last contribution said uh, she was optimistic. I wish I felt the same. Um, I, I live in the heart of uh, Galloway, God's own country, the most beautiful constituency in Scotland. Um, <laughs> and very much embedded in, in, uh, in, in nature, being brought up on a farm and, and still living uh, right in the heart of it. M my concerns are that Whilst it's, we, we have some fantastic ambitions when it comes to, to carbon, we do have ambitions when it comes to, to the environment generally. And um, I worry that we are racing down a road at the moment which is seeing large parts of Scotland being bought up for greenwashing, carbon credit type um, offsetting, uh, which is seeing, particularly in Dumfries and Galloway, at a terrifying rate, upland farms and not even upland farms, productive farming land being bought uh, at hugely inflated prices for commercial planting. You know, you touched on a uh, homogeny. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what's happening. Um, and, I, and I've raised it a numer numerous times to committee about how we're racing so far down a road that when we realise we're getting it dramatically wrong, we're, gonna, we're not going to get anywhere near next year because of what we're doing. So we're going to lose the biodiversity. Um, we've also got other pressures, uh, food security. So we're, we're seeing farmers rightly or wrongly calling for some of the, the environmental measures that have been part of their single farm payments being taken away. So fuel margins and whatever actually being ploughed up. That's unlikely to happen because they don't have the money to buy the fertiliser then to grow the crops and those fuel margins. But there's a whole range of different uh, pressures which I think will make it difficult. In this parliament, absolutely, as Brian says, we're all incredibly concerned about biodiversity whatever, but we currently we've got a committee system which doesn't allow proper scrutiny of proposals that are coming forward. We've got a net zero committee, which is actually tasked with looking at biodiversity. And we've got a rural affairs committee that looks at all the land use and whatever, which has, has the most dramatic effect on the environment, which has no remit. So biodiversity in a way sits between the two committees and I do worry that we're not going to get the proper scrutiny or, or proper attention to what I believe is far more important than climate change. If we don't get our soil science right, we don't get uh, rewilding right, our planting, our peatland restoration, we can forget about ever getting anywhere near net zero. Well, we might for one year, but net zero doesn't finish in 2040 or, or whatever. It, we're going to have to continue 
uh, to, to uh, look at the carbon issue. So I'm not particularly optimistic, and it's a terrible thing to say because I'm a pretty sorry. I'm an optimistic <coughs> guy, but in this, I think we need to do far more, and we need to look at the policies at the moment, which are actually flying in the face of everything you've said today, um, particularly with commercial planting. So. Sorry, it's not a question, it's a bit of a, <laughs> a rant. I'm afraid. Well, um, to, to, to be fair, I think we are used to you ranting. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know if anybody would like to comment on, on, on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, please, Anne. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go first on the local. Um, I think you raised some really important issues, and that's partly why we've been talking about getting nature at the heart of government, because it needs to be across all portfolios and across all um, strategies and policy making, because you're right, planning, farming subsidies, the forestry, uh, regional land use planning, all of it impacts on biodiversity. Unless we can align it all, then we're just not going to make the kind of changes we need to see. So that's a really important point. Um, the other thing is that there's also a place for learning lessons of the past. We've seen what happens, well Paul showed the picture, what happens when we put lots of sitka across the peatlands of the north. We need to not make those kind of mistakes again. And there is the potential for us to start to go in that direction. So learning lessons from the past is really important. And then I think the, the other really important point you raise is the immediate issues, is, is taking our eye off the ball. And the big ball is the climate and nature emergency. And if we start to focus too much on the immediate issues without thinking about future generations, future resilience, then that's where the issues are just going to get bigger for future generations like Millie. They're going to have a much, much tougher job unless we start to realise that we can't, we need to address all of this stuff together, not just today's food security issues, for example. The future's just as important. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Uh, unusual. Yeah. Um, it, it's. Uh, I think to be an environmentalist and conservation, you really have to be a, a, an optimist. And I'm delighted that Millie, um, who, who who was a volunteer who has spent hundreds of hours pulling Sitka spruce out of peatlands in uh, Caithness and Sutherland. Um, uh, you, you know, you, you really need to have that sort of optimi optimistic frame of mind. But, but Deborah is exactly right. The, the problem is we have not seen that mainstream. We have not seen um, biodiversity and nature given proper policy priority and proper funding priority. But we have seen a transformation in the way Scotland approaches the climate emergency in, in, in recent, very recent years, which I think is a brilliant model for how things actually can change with collective will. And I'm absolutely delighted to see people from across the House, uh, members from across the House attending today. On the, uh, on the, the, the issue of non-native conifers just proliferating everywhere is a massive issue for biodiversity. 5,000 pairs of curlews were lost in Dumfries and Galloway alone in the 80s and 90s because of commercial uh, plantation. And that species is now internationally threatened. And Scotland has internationally important numbers of them. And we're going to see more of them lost. Research at the James Hutton Institute is beginning to indicate that ploughing and planting organic rich soils is not actually the carbon answer that people in the industry and in government often assume it is. That in fact, you lose a lot of carbon, you gain carbon above ground, but you lose it below ground because the soil flora and fauna change carbon cycles when it's lost to the air and lost to the water table. So these big carbon equations need to be taken into account and the science is beginning to be there. And those James Hutton um, you know, scientists in discussion anyway are beginning to say maybe natural regeneration from existing woodlands would be a really carbon impactful way to meeting our woodland expansion targets that actually wouldn't involve the kind of disruption that you're talking about. So if we can get that integrated into public policy, that sort of creative thinking, yeah, we can do the right thing for nature, which natural regeneration would do, reconnecting um, fragments of woodland. And a lot of that would be in the central belt and the south, which would be beneficial for people as well as biodiversity. Answers can be found. And that, I think, is the kind of hopeful message that the NGO sector would like to bring to this, is that it is possible to do this stuff. But I, I, I fully understand, Finlay, it is not looking great always at the moment, but let's be a wee bit more optimistic. <laughs> I'm glad you raised James Hunt and things like that. I think soil and, you know, we've got bug life in our member link, but uh, the, the shame is not a microbial life, because I think ultimately over the last 10 years when it's come to regenerative farming, that ultimately is the first building block, not just to the bugs in the soil, but to our hedgehogs and our our, our biodiversity I might just say that there was a wee laugh when you said that, but I, you are absolutely bang on. I mean, I'm sure Chris would agree with that. I mean, you're exactly right. We really need to get more active about soil. 
It's, it's a critical part of, the, of an ancient climate emergency, so I would agree. Hey, Monica. Thank you. One killing in MSP for Central Scotland. And I'm just wondering, Monica, what one I think we have to be bolder in this parliament we do have to pick up the pace and I think the points that Finlay made about the work of the committees I think you know these are, are live discussions I think we have to get better as a parliament at how we do scrutiny and recognise that you know we have to mainstream climate and nature it's not about one portfolio or one committee so there's a challenge I think for, for all of us to make sure that when we're doing um, you know, committee inquiries, looking at legislation, we don't behave in, in silos. So that's a, a challenge for all of us. But given there's so much passion across the Parliament, I maintain that I will be a, an optimist. Um, I wanted to ask a question. It's also a bit of a plug for some legislation that I'm working on. So there's a very active movement globally to stop ecocides. Um, I think Scotland needs to really, you know, be part of that, that journey. So I'm at a very early stage of looking at a, a possible members bill in Scotland to have our own ecocide law, uh, which eventually would join up as part of the, the campaign for um, ecocide to be recognised by the International Criminal Court. So that's been described as a, as, a, as a law that could act as a guardrail for the earth. It's a bit like an insurance policy to try and prevent the most damaging um, acts uh, that damage climate and uh, nature. So I just wonder if our panel have a view on um, how an ecocide law in Scotland could help with the pace and the ambition and to really change you know, systems and, and behaviours, not just about individuals, but you know, corporations uh, and other organisations that are doing the most damage. So a plug and a question and a, a comment too. We'd like to take that on. I can make a start. Um, I, it's it's a really great initiative to be to be hear, hearing about, and it's great that you are taking the lead on it. I think there is a lot of potential, and one thing that is beneficial, I think, is that some of the global targets coming through COP15 relate directly to ecocide. So one of them, for example, is about halting, eliminating, or redirecting incentives that are harmful to biodiversity. So that's exactly the sort of thing. You know, if that comes through the global framework, then to see that reflected in Scotland through an ecocide law and through the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy and the Natural Environment Bill would actually be very helpful. It shows that Scotland's a leader, we're taking it seriously, and then it, it's, it's serving both interests. So that's just one example, but, but there are lots of examples. The live one on the table at the moment, obviously, is the farming subsidy and what we do with that. And then Finley, of course, mentioned forestry as well. So, you know, there's lots of strands there that could be picked up that are directly relevant to, to ecocide. So, yeah, I'll wait to hear about it. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely brilliant that you're taking a lead on that. And what, one of the areas where I think Scotland could really make a big difference here is actually defining uh, what, what ecocide actually is. Because at the moment, I'm sensing there's a lot of quite fast and loose playing with the science. And yet Scotland has some world leading um, nat natu natural scientists and natural science, because not just James Hutton Institute, but many other learned in institutes across the country. And actually, um, you know, so, so we're beginning to hear things like there's no real difference between a native tree and a non-native tree and sitka plantations are just as good for biodiversity as ancient ancient uh, rainforest. We in, we in the NGO sector would, 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 would challenge that, but, but no one is kind of challenging it at the moment. So I think one of the risks here is that we take all this enthusiasm for, that, for, for tackling the nature and climate emergency is actually done in a way which actually doesn't really deliver for nature and uh, ecocide law would, could really help to sort of formalise that. Um, so, yes, be really interested in talking further with you about that, actually, perhaps not, not here, but it's fascinating. Yeah, well, it's a big conversation. Everyone's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Fiona. Hi, I'm, I'm Fiona Sivan, the uh, Deputy Convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. And, you know, we as a committee, and um, Monica is a member of that, um, are quite clear that we want to ensure that the uh, climate crisis and nature crisis is as our, our, our parallels are equally important. So to give you that reassurance, that's already happening. In fact, we are discussing when we would you know, we look at COP15, but obviously the delay in COP15 has, yeah. has affected that. Um, and it, but it occurs to me um, uh, that if we really want to, to do that, it's um, uh, we, we need to think about how we do that mainstreaming, but perhaps think about it in a way that's, that has most impact. 
I actually think the current setup of the government ministers is, is exactly trying to make sure that nature and net zero are, are given that parallel and related importance. And it makes it more challenging for us as a parliament in scrutinising that, but I mean, there's ways to deal with that. I just wonder if there are specifically, and you, you, you mentioned soil, we've had debates already about regenerative farming, you mentioned in, 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 in reference in parliament. Is there something where we could actually really ramp up the duality of those two crises that, that they're interlinked and equally important. What are the factors that are common? Because I think that would probably focus minds and be you know, in, in terms of impact and they're not they're not in competition uh, necessarily. Um, or they could be you could sort of alert the bits that say, well these are the bits particularly you know sort of spruces, that's where people's focus is. But even at my um, knowledge and brief time in this portfolio um, in the committee I don't think people are in that space. I think that has moved on. The issue is how and how do we make sure the policy and the funding follows that. So where would you pick if you were to do a sort of, you know, like a Venn diagram, where where is where is the most acute interface between um, the nature crisis and the, what you might call the next <coughs> climate crisis that we could actually focus on to ramp this up? Because I think impactful, that's probably a way to challenge everybody to, to do more and to do it quicker. Good question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's such a it's such a challenging question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there are there are there are clear cases where where nature conservation and the climate crisis are, are, are just absolutely aligned. So I remember reading the statistic that twenty percent of Scotland's carbon emissions can come from degraded peatlands. So the restoration of peatlands and the climate crisis just they they sit hand in glove. And then there are other areas, as, as Finley was alluding to, where um, the nature crisis and the, and, and, and the climate emergency might appear to be aligned, but when you dig a little deeper, it turns out that perhaps things aren't as rosy as you know we imagine with, with uh, homogenisation of you know planting planting trees for for carbon storage. So. Um, I mean, it's a terrible thing to have to say, but it's almost, to me, it's almost like a case-by-case -case basis. So the peatland issue is very clear-cut, the forestry issue, much less so. And, and maybe the thing to do is to interrogate each of these issues on an ecosystem level and think, okay, we've got peatlands, we've got forestry, we've got agroforestry, you know, and, and, and where are the traps? Where are the benefits and where are the traps in each of those cases? Um, one thing that really occurs to me, and this is in, about the marine environment, um, so we have um, phytoplankton, the basis of marine food chains, okay, it blooms in the spring according to day length, as day length increases. The zooplankton that grazes on it blooms in the spring depending on sea surface temperature warming, and that is getting earlier. And that means that the phytoplankton and the zooplankton are now out of synchrony. There's a lack of food for the sand eel, a sand eel is food for seals, whales, dolphins and seabirds. And the Scottish uh, seabird population has declined by half since the mid-1980s. Fishing's an issue, bycatch's an issue, but the really big one is climate change. So climate change is driving down our seabird populations. The, the, the ambition that we have around renewable energy it, it, it is hugely welcome in terms of response to climate change. But we know that these wind farms are going to kill some more of those seabirds. And when you kill adult seabirds, they're long-lived, slow-breeding birds. They can't breed fast enough to make up the losses, so we're going to see populations go further down. The profound irony is, as a result of response to the main driver of the current declines, it's a real problem. But what can we do? What we can do is take some of the outcome of that industry, i.e. some of the money that is generated, put it back into conservation, do things like run a rolling programme of island restoration and biosecurity across the whole Scottish archipelago, where we're clearing invasive non-native species that stop seabirds from breeding on those islands, maximise the number of breeding opportunities that seabirds have to allow them to best utilise the food that will be there in future. So what, what I think you need to do is sort of see, uh, identify the problems and then try to create sort of nature positive and carbon positive solutions to them both. And I do agree with Chris that seeing on an, an, an ecosystem by ecosystem basis is really helpful, but if we see Scotland's seabird islands as one ecosystem, mm -hmm. then we can really do something for seabirds. But that means people, you know, who are really focused on climate <coughs> need to be thinking about nature as well. Mm -hmm. And I think there will be a number of examples like that: salt marshes, 
estuaries, etc., where we can really make a difference. And then, of course, blue carbon, which I know you've been thinking <laughs> about. statement this afternoon. Statement this afternoon, which is really very welcome. Can Good. I quickly offer yep. just one, one final interface? The thing that immediately sprung into my mind is that we're not talking enough about natural regeneration you know, of woodland. If you, if you go back long enough, and, and Chris referenced this, if you go back long enough, and if you leave any piece of ground in Scotland without um, heavy grazing, you will get trees. So natural regeneration is really important. And the beauty of that is that it conserves the soil because you're not releasing carbon, because you're not planting and you're not, you're not ploughing. So natural regeneration is something we should be talking much, much more about. Other benefit, you get native species coming in. But in order to do that, you need to tackle deer. And the deer management issue is something, that's a real interface there that needs to be tackled so that we, we can address the way we manage a lot of our land in Scotland and make sure that it is delivering for nature and for rural communities at the same time. Thank you. I, thought I, was, I was actually going to mention the fact that it's interesting enough that we have got a nice deal state this afternoon on blue carbon and I think you'll find that th those of us who are who are replying to that statement have been rushing around the last couple of days reading up to find out what the hell blue carbon is <laughs> to make sure we understood, we actually understand. So, but, but, but I think from from this conversation hopefully what you gain and, and what you grasp is, is that, that, that we are as a parliament taking this very very seriously. Um, and and all of us, I mean, I I, I should have mentioned I'm I'm the, the shadow spokesman on environment, biodiversity, and land reform. Um, so I'm running at a rate of knots uh, to to make sure that I'm up to speed on a lot of these things. It's, which is why it's so great to have you along here. Great to welcome you in here, and great to hear what you what you have to say. I think, as you said right at the start, uh, Deborah, putting nature at the heart of government is key to this. I think. Um, that's some of the things I would love to have got into if we'd had yeah. more time is, 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 is how we support our food producers because we give them custodianship of the countryside and, 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 and it's this, there seems to be this tension between producing food and, 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 and creating a good environment and how you know, we could get into vertical farming and all, all of those potential solutions and, and, and maybe that's, that's for an, another, another time. I think you know, we know that Scotland is, is um, it's a country world famous uh, for its wildlife and landscapes. I mean, maybe slightly biased in here, but you know, uh, more biased even than than, than, than friendly in his his area. But to find out in this in this that, that we are such a nature depleted country, it's one of the worst nature depleted depleted countries and territories in the world, is a shock. Mm. And I think one of the things that that that, that strikes me is is our our ability. It's, maybe it's a responsibility of everybody in this room is how we get the message out of what we as individuals should be doing and of what you know one of the big things that's always come into my mind is the pollinators you know how we're losing pollinators at such a, a, a huge rate how do we get that message out and how do we do we as individuals tackle those those kind of issues and i know i know a lot of the loss is historical but but we're still losing uh, nature now uh, uh, you know with one in nine risking a national extinction i mean that, that's that's a, a stat that should worry us all but I think that there is, you know, the, the challenge to help nature recover, I think there's also a chance to create opportunities, as again, we said today, and I think a nature positive future for Scotland delivers so many benefits, uh, especially in things like creating green jobs and skills and improving health and wellbeing, which has been such a topic over the last couple of years. And then in, in so doing, creating a much more resilient economy and society. I think so far e efforts to tackle uh, the nature crisis is lagging behind uh, efforts to limit global temperature rises and uh, and and, and, uh, and this is as true in Scotland as, as anywhere else. Uh, we have got very ambitious targets in Scotland uh, which have realised it do help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions but there's not yet that same equivalent targets in place uh, for nature. I think the real task is, is not just about talking about the nature climate emergency and, and setting targets, it's, it's about how we m set out a route map to, to achieving and exceeding those targets, because as we've heard today uh, from our excellent speakers, it's not an option, we have to do it. So it just it, it just it falls me to thank our, our, our speakers today, thank you Deborah, Christopher, Paul and Millie for great presentations and instigating such, such great debate. We could probably stay here all afternoon and, and hopefully this is the first of many such events we have in Parliament. So thank you all for attending and as I say, 
Uh, I'm now rushing into the chamber <laughs> to talk about blue carpet, so I have to go through. So thank you very much.